would be nice to think that every graduate within their first year um, of employment is going to play a Hollywood lead. And that's a dream. And every graduate should have it. I've still got it as a dream. But it's a dream. It's not an objective. Hi, this is Marisha Trembetska for my Love Your Creativity and Make Money podcast. And the clip I just played is of an interview I did back in 2014 with Paul Clayton, the the actor who's an actor, he does corporate work, he's done huge amounts of theatre and film. I'm not going to give you his CV, but it ranges from Peep Show to Ali G in the House to The Queen. Four years at the RSC, you get the point, right? So... But because my podcast, which is, of course, Love Your Creativity and Make Money, I want to think about this week about the fact that most creatives have multiple income streams. From that same interview, here's a little clip about what Paul Clayton said and Nita Dobson, who, of course, was famous for (laughs) her amazing role in EastEnders. This is what she said about acting as a career. The, the life force and national treasure that is Anita Dobson uh, has recently joined the board um, of the centre at uh, my invitation. And she says that, you know, she never used to call herself an actress until the first year when she earned enough money that she didn't do any other jobs. And that was you know, quite late. Um, and I think that's, you know, an interesting proposition. I think when we look in the world and we identify as being an artist or a painter or a filmmaker... If that's the only thing we do and it's not paying the bills, there can be a real sense of frustration. And the truth is, working actors, working creatives generally, we earn money using our skills in lots of different ways. So this is a a question, I guess, to you guys about have you thought about writing a list of all your skills down and where else you can cross sell them? Now, in some ways, it's obvious, uh, as in, oh, I'm an I like to paint, but maybe I can start doing logos for people. Maybe I can learn to extend my my skills down a Photoshop way, doing branding as a part-time job when the other gigs come in. You might be a filmmaker, for example, but that also means, I've seen it, many filmmakers I know make corporate films for people. So they have other regular forms of income doing the same kind of thing, but the truth is they're using all their skills and ensuring that they are not as Paul Clayton would, you know, say, I'm not resting, I'm fighting to stay alive. So I'm going to include at the end of this little podcast some hand-chosen clips by me of that interview I did with Paul Clayton because I think they're really relevant to this conversation about how we think about our art and how we keep the wall from the door. But I would encourage you to really have a think about where, I mean, obviously we're kind of still in lockdown now, But where else can you extend your specific set of talents and gifts and skills in certain areas? I mean, I was doing some role play in February. I do lots of role play acting, actually. But this time it was on Zoom. And I found my uh, the actor community. There's quite a lot of us who end up doing the same kind of role plays together. They're all incredible. They all do other things to make sure that until they get the big break of the theatre role or the netflix series or whatever they're all making sure they're still being productive and they're not desperate they're not feeling desperate when they go in for auditions or sky uh, or obviously at the moment it's self tapes and it applies to all of us but certainly my role play colleagues and i don't do that much of it i probably do i don't try and do too much role play but it's certainly a few weeks at least every year because it brings in some decent income and it's another thing to not stress from one of my colleagues who is an actor At the moment, when he's not doing role play, he has a company where he films and shoots showreel for actors who haven't got decent showreel. So he's been incredibly busy because, of course, the normal ways that people gain showreel, for example, is acting even in student films. So at least you get showreel, la, la, la. And now he's like, well, so he's got a separate part of his business, which is not him acting, but still within the field. It also teaches him a huge amount about lighting, seeing people work on stage, how they're hitting their marks. So I just would like you to have a think about, for yourself, write down all the things you're really good at. What are the subsidiary skills that you've taught yourself in your creativity? Obviously, if you are a fiction writer, then you've obviously developed the gift of telling a story. So can you start writing blog 
posts? Can you start selling your skills to write posts for other magazines and journals? There's so many different ways that you can, we can all expand our skills. Go and see in the corporate world if they've got any copy they need writing for publicity releases, etc., etc. And it is about developing networks. But I have got clients who don't ask me to act, but they completely use the acting skills that I have used. I mean, I have modelled quite a lot. Um, I never meant to be a model. I don't see myself as a model, but absolutely. I've done corporate role play. I've done voiceover work. Oh, I've done emceeing. I've emceed uh, cabaret nights. I've emceed comedy nights. Of course, I'm a comic as well. As um, And certainly the singing psychic is very much kind of where I'm at with that at the moment, my singing psychic character. But it means that I can easily host and run rooms and I do a huge amount of it. You know, when I was hired to do a TEDx as a singing psychic, they also said, can you open as yourself, open it, get the, the room warmed. You know, you're, I, I call myself a fluffer. All the skills I have got help me keep on making money so that just because one, at the moment, all my live gigs have disappeared. We know that for the last year, but I've been able to keep on, the, keep on earning because I've used and I've linked into more work than others because I've had to. But... Thank you. luckily I've still got a roof over my head and I've been able to support that because I have lots of different ways of earning and me as an actor means I'm good as a presenter I'm good at presenting myself so that's why eventually some people go from being an actor and presenter and stay in that place I choose not to do that but I just think it's really important to really rattle the cage and start brainstorming about what else you can do to earn income from your talents whatever they are filmmaker writer painter comic there's a whole host of things you can bring so so you are fighting to stay alive but actually enjoying it there's so much uniqueness you bring to it because you do have to sustain yourself until the time is right as Anita Dobson would say but I would argue actually that it's not just about being the time is right Um, see when I was in my very very first job a lovely lovely actress called Dillis Hamlet who's not with us anymore and she had her name above the title in this production of Winter's Tale in, in Manchester and on her first day of rehearsal, she came to me in the uh, interval of the read, so she was incredibly glamorous. And um, she said, oh, we read that beautifully, darling. And I thought, well, obviously I did. You know, I've left drama school. I'm the next best thing to slice bread. And uh, I went, oh, thank you very much. And she said, yes, do you know, when you're 40, you'll never stop. <laughs> How old were you then? I was 21, and I was thinking, and I thought for the mass moment, I thought, ooh, brilliant. And I thought, ooh, hang on, um, that's 19 years to fill. And actually, you know, I did work, and I did some really good work, but she was right. And when I hit 40, I suddenly got into what I do. I achieved my own weight, you know, because at drama school I used to play all the older roles, and some of the best roles, which was brilliant, but I always played the older people. Um, and I hit 40, and then when I hit 50, I, which I think was the same time as I was doing Petra, um, brilliant, and it's just gone up and up, and I've been incredibly lucky, but um, uh, there's been a waiting time to get there. We can't kind of worry about when we're going to make it. We have to say every day, let's move our careers forward, let's go after our dreams. Obviously, I've made a huge amount of my own work. What has happened is the more work I've made for myself, the less work I do for others. And at some point, I might get slightly frustrated by that. But at least I've got work. If someone asks me what I've been doing, well, I can give you a 25-hour lecture on what I've been doing over the last year on COVID. (laughs) God help me. So there we are. So I'm going to play now a few extra clips from the amazing Paul Clayton interview. He talks about it from being... From an, uh, often from the acting perspective, he's been a director and all the other things, but his wisdom is incredible. He and I did a film together back in 2014 that we mentioned, Sunday Dinner with the Morgans. You can actually see the, the short. It, oh my goodness, it ran around about 40 f- uh, festivals in the world. It won so many awards. It even got to the second list of shortlist for a, a student Oscar. That's where we got with that film. That, but I've known Paul for many years beforehand. So... Do have a listen to the rest of this with Paul. I will actually put the whole podcast interview I did with Paul, the original one. Um, I'll do it as a podcast after this. So this is number 36. So I'll make 37 number podcast, the full interview with Paul. So if you want to hear the whole of his brilliance, because whether if you are, 
well, not just if you're an actor, but whoever you are, I feel it's going to be of great value to you. So hopefully this has been a very useful episode for you. Uh, my name is Marisha Trembetska. This was my Love Your Creativity and Make Money podcast. The original Paul Clayton podcast interview was done on my first podcast, which was Love Your Creativity, which is still up. You can find it. But I, I occasionally bring some stuff over from that. But uh, the problem is I started it in 2013 and then spoke about making creative stuff. And then next thing I know, I'm so busy working for everybody else, doing their projects and then my own, I stopped my podcast. Uh, and I'm not going to get into, oh, if only I'd carried on, because that's just a pointless waste of time and energy. All I can do is carry on, right? You can't worry about what you didn't do. But if you want to go back... So have a listen if you want to podcast 37. If you want to book me as an actor, my agent is Dulcie Houston at CCA Management in London. If you want to book me to talk about creativity or indeed book my singing psychic or my Queen of the Fucking World show, I'm on at Marisha T on Instagram, Twitter, all the normal places. Um, Marisha Trembetsk on Facebook... And I've got some stuff on YouTube as well. So there we are. Have an amazing week ahead. Have a listen to the next bits of Paul. But I, as I said, if you want to go and listen to the next one after number 37, that's a whole full interview with Paul. And I mean, he's an amazing actor. So that means, by definition, he's an amazing storyteller. He really is. Just to listen to his, uh, his tales of acting and woe. And at one point, he was chair of the Actors' Centre. So this is not a man who doesn't understand about the business of acting. Brilliant, it's a Thursday, the sun is shining, it's March, um, spring is on its way, lockdown hopefully is out by June, then there's going to be dancing and heels and tight dresses, I can't wait. Um, <laughs> I'm not even sure I'm going to be able to dance in my high heels anymore, because of a year uh, in my uh, fluffy slippers. Hmm. Anyway, okay, um, just be really good and be well. Bye, Marisha Trombetska, signing out. I think I'm quite resigned about it now because I think there comes a stage in your life where, and this is probably to do with you developing as a person and perhaps there were elements of me that were a late development. Um, certainly in relationship terms, you know, I didn't really settle down with anybody until I was nearly 40. Uh, and that did coincide, I think, with an awareness of who and what you are as a person. And I know that as a young actor, I would walk into a room and I, I, I didn't have confidence problems. I might have been nervous, but I don't think that would necessarily come across. But I would go into the room thinking, I know I'm a very good actor. What would you like me to be? Um, and I don't think that works. I think you have to go in there saying, this is what I am. Would you like it? And I am the best Paul Clayton there is. Um... I think there'll be some people breathing a sigh of relief that I'm the only Paul Clayton there is. Um, but I, I'm not bothered if you don't want Paul Clayton. Obviously, there are some things that I would love to do, but that I am not right for. So it's not that I'm not good, it's that I'm not right. And, you know, last week I was waiting for a voiceover, and I don't know what it was. My agent went, are you free on this day? It's a really big one, it's a really nice one. I didn't know what it was. And then on Thursday morning, there yeah, they've gone the other way. So... I don't know what it was. They've gone the other way because something they heard in that person's voice made them make that choice. Um, because what, what wins people over is you, the person. Um, that's what we bring to acting. And I know some people mistake this with typecasting, but you bring a unique brand to your work that is you. And... Possibly a lot of our life is finding out who we are, and then when we settle into a knowledge of that, we sort of know what we're selling, really. He had a saying which was, every day, do one thing that may result in work, and then get on with being who you are. Because who you are is what will get you the work. And I know, having directed a lot in my 30s for a lot of rep companies, so sitting on the other side of the table and having old days of people coming in, you can see desperation. You can, you can smell it. And it's not nice. You have that job. You have the job until you open the door. And then when you step in the room, 
most of what you're doing is taking you away from the job unless you're careful. So it's working about what you need. You know, you don't need to. If you go in and think I've got to shine in there, if you're not shining outside, you know, you're not going to do it. This is Marisha Trembetska for my Love Your Creativity and Make Money podcast. Just be-